Uh, hello, everybody. I can't really see uh, most of you, but uh, this has become the, the new normal for academics giving lectures on Zoom. Uh, welcome to um, this Hofstra virtual event. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, empirical view of human nature today. And uh, that um, it's actually something that I'm quite interested in. I'm glad not to be talking about coronavirus right now. I've been talking a lot about that in, in terms of my specialty of anxiety and depression. So this is a, a nice change of pace. Um, just a little bit of background. And if you want to know more about me, you can go to my website. But I'm a professor of psychology at Hofstra University. I'm actually a clinical psychologist, not an evolutionary psychologist. But we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. I direct the anxiety and depression clinic there and also the uh, doctoral program in clinical psychology. So um, what, what I'm gonna do is um, uh, I'm gonna have a few polls to get some information and get everybody involved. And we're gonna start with one here, just give me a little bit here. It's a little clunky at times. All right, so you have uh, 20 seconds to answer each poll. So we'll, let's start with this one. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hold on. I didn't give you the uh, apologies. <laughs> All, right. Oh, boy. All right. So I'm sorry about that. Let's try that again. Um, let's start here. So I'm going to cover three general areas today. Um, one, uh, discuss the case for a theory of the universal human nature. And believe it or not, depends on where you stand on this, that it's actually a controversial idea, uh, as I'll show you. Um, second, uh, we're gonna talk about how this nature developed and what does it look like, especially the key features. And i um, going to talk about um, the process of natural selection, which is an evolutionary process that selects for certain types of psychological mechanisms that were adaptations in the environment that it evolved in. So that sounds a bit more technical probably than you want to hear, but I'll try to make it much, uh, much more straightforward than that. And three, uh, something that's particularly interesting from an applied standpoint is did evolution build us well to function in our modern environment? So those are the three areas I'm going to cover. There's a lot of material. It's hard to make it uh, to do this in a short amount of time, but I'm definitely hoping to, uh, to finish before um, 12 o'clock. Okay, so let's start with what we mean by human behavior. Now, broadly defined, human behavior is the things we do and care about, emotions, motivations, and preferences. And there's really this, you may be familiar already with something called the nature-nurture debate. And the nature debate says our genes or DNA is most important in determining human behavior. On the other hand, the nurture debate uh, side of the debate says the environment is most important. And, um, and, and so we're gonna sort of look at that debate and, and look at the science uh, behind it to see what's supported here. Now, let's just quickly define human nature. Human nature, this is from Wikipedia from yesterday. Human nature is a bundle of characteristics, including ways of thinking, feeling, and acting, which humans are said to have naturally. The term is often regarded as capturing what it is to be human or the essence of humanity. What's interesting, this is my underlying emphasis here. This is now Wikipedia saying this. The term is controversial because it dis it's disputed whether or not such an, is, an essence exists. Right? So sort of saying that, th that they realize that the concept of human nature is a controversial area. Okay, so we're going to start with a poll here. All right, let me, I'm gonna re, I'm gonna relaunch this poll. All right. One more time, 20 seconds. Actually, we'll do 10 seconds just for time. That's enough for people to process this. Here we go. Okay. So, what you could see is that, I'm oh, sorry, you don't see it. Overwhelmingly, people would be, prefer to go into the cage with a horse than a tiger, right? And I'm gonna get to that point in a second, but you know, once again, just for the, 
for the fun of it, I'll, I'll sort of pull you on it. I'm going to get to the meaning of that in a second. And now we're going to go look at a second thing here. Pull two. And pull two is Apologies for the delay. Here we go. Would be more comfortable getting into an elevator late at night with a stranger who was a male or female or no preference. Right. And there's the results for that one. Now, what does this mean? And What we could get into is two things. First of all, you know that different species have different natures. And within a species, they're remarkably similar. So for the most part, if you have the choice of a tiger and a horse, you'd prefer to get into the cage with the horse because you know in general, it's less dangerous, it's less threatening. So my, one of my points is going to be that just like other species, humans have a nature, right? Horses have a nature, tigers have a nature, dogs have a nature, humans have a nature. And this is something that's been understudied. Now, you do know already that humans have a nature. Everybody does. Because we make judgments about human nature all the time, whether we accept it or not. And just as an example, overwhelmingly, uh, the, uh, most individuals were more comfortable getting into an elevator late at night with a female than a male. And the reason is something that we all know is that males are much more aggressive and commit more crimes than females. Uh, so, so being with a female is sort of safer in that type of situation. And so once again, everybody knows human nature and everybody knows that males and, and females are different, especially in some ways. And aggression and crime is one way. We'll come back to that point later. Now, one question might be uh, how a clinical psychologist became interested in evolutionary psychology. And I think this will give you a flavor for the debate. So that's why I'll give you my personal story here. So I'm a clinical psychologist who's primarily inter primary interest in studying anxiety disorders, both the, the nature of them and the treatment of them. And as I moved into my career, what we found is that for the most part, uh, if we saw people that had phobias, they were more afraid of snakes than cars. And so when, when I, and that's somewhat counterintuitive because most people never encounter a snake. And many people drive, have been in car accidents, know people that are killed in car accidents and so on. And in the same way that people are terrified of mice, but not electrical outlets. Now in terms of danger, cars and electrical outlets are much more dangerous to people in the modern environment, right, for all of us. Uh, the idea of being contaminated by a mouse or constricted or bitten by a snake are incredibly rare. Snake deaths in the U.S. are less than 10 per year. Car deaths in the U.S. are 50,000 per year. So, it, so something else is going on uh, in humans' brains. And this was sort of my first tip off on this, that, that there must be something built in already. And we're going to get back to snakes in a bit about why we do fear snakes. And it only can be explained with a human nature evolutionary psychology explanation. The second thing is, uh, or not the second thing, uh, most of us uh, in certainly uh, in social sciences have been sold on this idea of the blank slate. This is considered the social sciences model. And basically, without reading the statement, this is the classic statement. It's suggesting that, if you will, our brain is a bit like silly putty and it gets molded by our experiences. So if you will, the difference between a criminal and a doctor is not their DNA. It's the fact that of their environment, maybe how they were raised, how they were parented, something about their culture. And this is very popular still today in, uh, in social sciences like psychology and sociology. The, once again, the notion that it's our behavior is largely a, a, a function of our environment. Um, so for, for example, like what we might find attractive uh, for males and females in a mate, the idea is we've been socialized to find those things attractive. 
So I've been going around for a while saying that the blank slate needs to be completed, uh, terminated, uh, the blank slate must die. And that the reason is that it just doesn't explain the reality of human nature. Um, think about it, we clearly accept the idea that physical attributes are largely inherited, right? How tall we are, the color of our hair, the fact that you have two eyes placed where they are in your head. But many ex explanations of human behavior and psychology are based on what I call the blank slate ish, because no one fully holds to the blank slate idea anymore, uh, but are based on more of a bank, blank slate mentality rather than science. For example, violence and aggression between males and females, differences. Uh, are humans altruistic? I'll tell you they're not. Just try to get some toilet paper. Uh, standards of attraction. Males and females have huge differences across all cultures on this. Um, so I won't go into all of these now, but I just want you to start to think about the idea that perhaps culture and the environment is overrated, and instead, much of our behavior is governed by, uh, by our DNA that comes from our evolutionary history that goes back millions of years. Okay? My students know that I'm always on the denial of human nature watch. And this is just a recent example where this is an article in a publication I love and read every day, the New York Times. And they had an opinion piece by, uh, by a psychologist. And the title of it was, It's Dangerous to Be a Boy. They smoke more, they fight more, they're far more likely to die young. This is males, of course, than girls. But their tendency to violence isn't innate. This is factually untrue. Research shows that this is not true. And it's not true in any species. So this is a perfect example. And the New York Times loves, despite, once again, my love for the New York Times, they love explanations of human behavior that are more oriented towards the blank slate. So why am I picking on the blank slate? Two reasons. One, I think blank slate is thinking, overvaluing the impact of the environment has impeded our ability to formulate an empirical view of human nature. In a sense, we're saying, look, everybody's different. Uh, everybody is a product of their culture. And as a result, we can't have a unified theory of human nature. Secondly, along that line, blank slate-ish thinking promotes the idea that humans across cultures are in fact much different than they really are, right? There's a lot of focus on, on different cultures, cultural diversity, cultural sensitivity. And I think when we look carefully at this, the surfaces are different, but the core features are the same. And it's causing us to think about people much different than they really are. I'll give you a couple of examples. Hello. First of all, in my own area of clinical psychology, one of the things that we find is that humans are, uh, across cultures, become depressed for the same reasons, right? That, and this is not uh, so surprising to you probably, but many of the provocations for depression unemployment, financial difficulties, interpersonal distress, bereavement, failure, loneliness, very current topic. These are the most common triggers across cultures. It's not like some cultures respond to certain types of stressors with depression and others don't. Once again, it's suggesting our emotional reactions are quite similar, and I could talk hours just about this topic. Second is, and this is a good example of what I mean by it's different on the surface. So if you will, these are desserts from different cultures that I found online. And what, although they look very different, and we might say, wow, look, cultures really are different. What they have in common is they're all high fat, high sugar products, high calorie. And so if you will, I think that I like this example personally um, to demonstrate this point is that cultures are remarkably similar. They go with what they have. If one culture has rice and one culture has apples, they're gonna make a dessert based on that. That's sort of a product of their environment. But the reality is there's no culture that celebrates the end of a meal or a holiday with broccoli with no uh, dressing on it. Instead, everyone prefers high calorie, high, high fat, high sugar foods as part of it. It's a mechanism that all humans have. I'm gonna come back to 
we'll have taste preference a little bit later because it's uh, easy to make some of these points with taste preference. The second point that I don't want to go too much into, but it's worth thinking about, is a concept called implicit meaning. So once again, it's a technical term. I'll try to make it less technical, but let's just look at the technical definition. Feeling-based experience of meaning that is not wholly conscious. So when I put this into words, something matters, but you're not exactly sure why. So food preferences, characteristics associated with physical attraction, emotional reactions to movies and television shows, caring so much about sports teams. You know you do, you just don't know why. So if I, if I ask you, you know, do you like broccoli, uh, uh, do you like ice cream better than broccoli? Most people would say yes, but they don't know why. But they know they do, and in fact, it's very powerful difference, but they don't know why. That's what we mean by implicit meaning. What I'm suggesting is somewhere uh, in our brain is the explanation. We're just not conscious of it, and it has to do with our evolutionary roots. So I want you to think of this idea now. I'm sort of throwing the, the first part out here. The blank slate is dead. Although many social scientists still love it, despite overwhelming data to that contrary, the two points I want to make here. One is our brain is programmed from our, our evolutionary history. And the model I use for my students in class is the idea of a smartphone. Think about your smartphone, whether it be an iPhone or an Android. It doesn't come with a blank disk. It comes with apps built in, right? So you turn the phone on, in the case of an iPhone, there's a mail app, there's a map app, there's a camera app, uh, uh, right? There's a text app. It's not a blank slate. It's not a blank disk. It comes with software or apps, in this case, built into it. It's a great metaphor to think of our brain in that way. Our brain is built in a way that comes with these apps already in them. The opposite idea of the blank slate. So much of the focus in evolutionary psychology is looking at underlying evolutionary roots of contemporary behavior, because our behavior at some level can look more sophisticated, but the reality is that this is just a modern example of a, an old application that's been running. And so just as an example, we know that throughout our evolutionary history, males brought females food. Males were the ones that supplied females uh, and the group for that matter, children and other males with food. In hunter-gatherer societies, males were, and today still are, in, in, in modern hunter-gatherer societies of hunters, right? So now, this is probably not a good dating strategy to bring a dead animal to someone that you're dating. A more modern example though, males often pay for dinner, especially on first dates or early on in dating. Even in our modern environment, 78% of females still think males should pay for the first date, despite the fact of women's equality, women's liberation, and women's ability to earn as much as males do across most jobs. So my point is just what's gonna illustrate, to highlight some of the, the issues, that this is just a carryover from our, our evolutionary history it's something that males were selected for and females were selected for. Females were selected to prefer males to provide resources. And as a result, they expect it and they find it attractive. Now the question is, is much of our behavior instinctual and rooted in our evolutionary history? And I think that this is an example that we tend to deny, but it's largely true. We could get into why we deny it. I'll come back to this once again a little bit later, but just to open up the idea now, there is a concept called human exceptionalism. We don't like to think of ourselves as another species, but the fact is we are another species. Biologically, we're another species, and psychologically, we're another species. And as a result, just like we know that other species have a nature and engage in relatively instinctual behavior, automatic behavior, without thinking much about it, so do humans. I'll give you an example. All right, I'm gonna launch a quick poll here. Okay. 
Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. I'm gonna share the results. Okay, so most of you are good at reading human nature. One person had it wrong there. And the question is, right, what can you know this? You know human nature, you know how to read uh, visual cues. And let's look at this a little bit more carefully because it's an interesting example. Okay. So across context, individuals, when they're winning, so to speak, raise their arms. We call this a dominance pose in humans and other species as well, that, that humans, when they're winning, they want to display their, their uh, dominance. Uh, technically, the term is signaling, uh, signaling theory. I'll, I'll come to that in the next slide. And so it doesn't matter you know, if you're winning, is that Wheel of Fortune here, or winning the golf match, or winning the election, winning the football game, or the fans are cheering for you at a concert, people raise their arms, jockey winning a race. And what's particularly interesting here is that even people that have never had sight engage in that behavior. So it's not as though they learned it from seeing it. It's once again built into our DNA, dominance displays. There's other dominance displays, but this is just one that's easy to, uh, to show you here. Now, the fact is that all species engage in dominance displays. Not surprisingly, the species that we're most related to, 99% sharing DNA, chimpanzees, they are not so different than our own dominance display. I forgot the name of this uh, animal here, but this is, the, this is a male. Ma males are usually the ones engaged in these dominance displays in other species. And this is a male showing how high they can jump and females find that attractive. So females of that species. So dominance displays are displaying our evolutionary fitness, meaning they're displaying the fact that we're doing well, that we're winning, so to speak. Yeah, it whole, it's um, just by the way, there's a couple of, I don't want to get too distracted with the um, chatting, but it's across cultures, by the way. The behaviors I'm going to be talking about are across cultures and often across species, what makes it uh, particularly powerful. So meaning that what we're focused on, and I'll come to this in a bit, are what are called human universals. These are things that run across cultures. And, and you'll see much behavior does, just like one, one we've already seen, which was preference for high fat, high sugar, uh, uh, foods. I will take questions at the end, by the way. All right, quick poll here. You can see I'm a frustrated game show host. Stop sharing that. And the poll for okay. Oh, there's the results, okay? Now, men on average are about three inches taller than women, but if the cards were just shuffled, if you didn't care about height, if females didn't care about height, that it would be about 60% of females would have a taller spouse, partner, and 40% wouldn't. What you could see overwhelmingly that, that females choose a male who's taller than themselves. And this is important um, because, uh, this is important because what it's suggesting, once again, is this is an instinctual preference. Most women don't think of it as though that they're looking for males to offer protection. But the fact is, throughout evolution, we know that females did. And as a result, this preference gets continued into our modern behavior, even though for the most part, males are not physically fighting other males and protecting females. Hopefully that's not the case, you'll end up in jail. And two, that you know, with something like a weapon, like a gun as an example, that you have, um, uh, that neutralizes any, anyone's size to be protective. And I wanna show you just how important this is. And there's one slide I don't have, I'll just mention it. But, um, stop sharing. Okay. So, okay. Now, er, that people know if you're trying to display a male as being powerful, that you have to show them taller than their mate. And so here's a couple of interesting examples. Tom Cruise, 
five foot eight, Katie Holmes, five foot ten. Would you know that from looking at this picture? Absolutely not. Tom Cruise is standing on something in this magazine cover to make him look taller than, um, than Katie Holmes, uh, if I didn't say the, the name right. And the reality is if you watch a Tom Cruise movie, and he's often with much taller females, uh, uh, someone like Nicole Kidman, as an example, is even taller than him, you'll never see one frame of that movie or any control photo where Tom Cruise is not taller than, than that. And the fact is that the reason is, once again, it's our human nature, not just females. We all want our heroes, action figures, to kind of look taller than others, look more powerful than others. This is a particularly interesting example. This is uh, Prince Charles, the stamp, Prince Charles and Princess Diana. And look at this right difference. They were the same size. You wouldn't know from looking at this postage stamp, right? And then, you know, if we will, if I could Photoshop better, imagine if we put her head taller than him, how it would make him look. Last thing, this is particularly relevant, and you can Google this for the results, but let me just tell you this. Since television, since we could see people, um, you know, going back to the 50s, the taller candidate has disproportionately won the presidential election. Overwhelmingly the case. I, wa I want to say that three quarters of the time, the taller candidate has won the election. Humans are geared towards choosing their leader who looks taller, more powerful. Now, the fact is, think about it. Once again, how, if you will, irrational this is, when we were hunter-gatherers, that leader might take us into warfare. And having a more powerful, physically powerful leader is important. But the fact of the matter is that we're not expecting Donald Trump to go to another country and beat the leader up. And, and that just shows us that we're still choosing leaders based on these archaic responses. Look at the data. Okay, moving on to topic two. How did human nature develop and what does it look like? And what we're gonna focus on is the role of natural selection in shaping psychological mechanisms. So there's Charles Darwin, and there's the, what many people consider the greatest scientific achievement in the history of humans, which is his publication on the origin of species. And remarkably, Darwin proposed a theory that was relatively sound, it's been modified over time without any of the technology that we have today. But let's focus on the idea of evolutionary theory applied to psychology, which is what we're focused on today. We call that evolutionary psychology. And evolutionary psychology is the ap application of evolutionary theory to explain human universals. Now, just for the record, there are three major processes of evolutionary theory. I don't have time to talk about them today. I just want you to know that, there, that different processes play out in the, in the ultimate process of natural selection and not just creating physically who we are, but creating psychologically or mentally who we are as well. Right? So look, once again, we all know that humans are essentially the same. There's some individual differences, there's personality differences, but for the most part, we know what they like and what they don't not like. Right, if you just told me the calorie content of a food, I could tell you what percentage of people are gonna like that. High calorie, lots of people, low calorie, less people. Uh, we know for the most part that humans can be aggressive, uh, but they can be cooperative, that they become aggressive when they feel threatened. There are situations where it's okay to become aggressive or even kill someone else, self-protection and war as an example. So this is some sense of human nature, and we know a lot about human nature, and I'll, I'll show you uh, uh, some of the details later. And we know that other species have a nature, right? A giraffe is different than a kangaroo, which is different than a polar bear. And you could think about like what you would want to come in contact with the wild, in the wild, and my guess is you prefer to come into contact with a toucan than a polar bear. And that's because we know their nature. Humans have the same nature, they're just another species. So there's a lot here to unpack, but let me just make the major points. Human nature represents psychological mechanisms that were evolutionary adaptive. This is a critical point, meaning throughout our evolutionary history that has gone on for millions of years, our brain is the product of those who survived, reproduced, and allowed for their offspring to reproduce as well. That's the essential evolutionary process. 
those that did not do that are no longer represented in the gene pool. So as a result, all of our characteristics, whether they be mental or biological, are a product of things that worked for our evolutionary ancestors. So let's look at some examples here. Human adaptations, anatomical or biological, we walk upright. That had to be an advantage, right? Many species don't walk upright. Eyes are in front of our head. Hunters have eyes in front of their head. Uh, prey have uh, uh, eyes on the side of their head for greater peripheral vision, right? Fever induced by a virus. This is something that evolved. People that did not develop, humans that did not develop fever when a virus occurred, eliminated from the gene pool, right? This is a hot topic right now. We all know that being exposed to a virus induces a fever and that fever kills off the virus. So these are biological mechanisms that were selected for. Those that had those qualities lived another day, reproduced, and passed on their genes those that didn't have those qualities were eliminated from the gene pool. That is essentially the product, the, 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 um, the nature of uh, natural selection. Now, we're very comfortable with these. We didn't used to think of these as product of evolution. The, pro the fact that we all have fear or anxiety, that we all care about what other people think of us, that we display sadness when we feel it, that we have a preference for high fat, high sugar foods, and other types of taste as well. And, um, the one that's interesting, I put it in italics because, because it's interesting in the contemporary environment, you could see how it's protective, right? But think about it, even before the pandemic, you didn't want people coughing sputum on you, right? The reason is that that's loaded with bacteria always. And so humans have evolved the disgust mechanism towards other bodily fluids. You didn't need to be taught that, that's in your DNA. And it can be protective. One of the problems with the current virus is that it can be passed on in ways that we can't detect. So as a result, we catch it even if someone didn't cough on you, right? We're good at dealing if someone coughs or vomits or sneezes. Those things we deal with well, you don't need to be taught. But the problem is if something's in the air, it's a little trickier. Let me just illustrate the classic example of natural selection then. How does this happen over time? Giraffe is the easiest one. Giraffe started out in evolution about look, looking like a horse. They had just sort of a regular size neck. But giraffes' environment, they eat leaves from trees. So think about it, you have to reach for leaves for trees. So over time, giraffes, just from normal variation that has slightly longer neck, were able to reach higher for food. Uh, and so, of course, they started with the low food, and then they reached for the high food. So what happens with the giraffes with the short, shorter neck? They're eliminated from the gene pool. And so right, it basically becomes competition right, biological evolutionary competition that giraffes with longer necks kept getting selected for because they had more access to food. And uh, so it's a relatively, relatively straightforward process, but an incredibly powerful process. All of our features are similar to the giraffe's neck. The fact that the way our hands look, the mental mechanisms we have, the emotions that we have, the preferences that we display in various contexts, all underwent the same process as a giraffe's neck. They were selected for because people that had that variation, humans that had that variation, did better than those who did not. That's the com concept of adaptation. So we could think of human nature, it's a decent slide, it doesn't exactly have it right. If I was to modify this a bit, it would say survive. Eating is part of survival, reproduce, and take care of your offspring. Those are the three driving forces in evolution. Remember, evolution's out of business if any of those things don't happen. If you don't survive, you can't reproduce. If you don't reproduce, you can't pass on your genes. And if you don't take care of the vehicle carrying your genes, offspring, that those genes cannot be represented into future generations. So one of the things we know about we know about our ancestors is they all had, had, they were able to survive. They had all the mechanisms in place to survive. They knew how to, um, to uh, find mates who were capable of reproducing and they have strong parenting mechanisms to take care of their offspring. So once again, a lot to unpack here. I'm just gonna hit the highlights here. This is sort of complicated material to cover in just one hour, but this is what we call the uh, empirical view of human nature, fundamental human motives. And so 
this is very simplified, but um, let me just point out here that this is a hierarchical structure intentionally. So meaning you have to survive. You, we're a social species, you have to get along with others and, and, and garner some status or esteem. You have to find a mate, retain that mate, produce offspring and parent those offspring. This is the most simple form of looking at human evolutionary motives. This has been true throughout our evolutionary history. And these are things that people tremendously care about today. Now, this is a simple story because you can think about it un within any of these motives or hundreds of complicated sub motives, right? I mean, just think of meeting your physiological needs. Right? You have to find the right food, you have to eat the right things, you have to avoid poisons or things that might harm you in some way. Um, you have to be, uh, uh, pr have preference towards essential nutrients. Uh, you know, same with self-protection, we're going on uh, major self-protection, we're self-protecting ourselves from an invisible virus. We're not so good at that. We're good at protecting ourselves from predators, from other threatening people, from dangers like heights and snakes as an example. We're social species, we have to get along with others, right? People who are lonely live less long than people who are socially connected. Uh, but think about social connection is very complicated and difficult, meaning we have conflict with people that uh, in order to get along with people, we have to learn how to read them in some ways. So my point here is that these are the broad areas, but within each of these, there are hundreds of sub motives that we're interested in in evolutionary psychology. And just a last point here, you could think of our emotions, right? Things like fear and happiness and pride and depression and guilt and shame and jealousy as things that compel us to meet these motives. Our emotions are forces that drive us to meet these motives. The fact that we care what other people think of us, for the most part, helps us increase our status and esteem. Right? The fact that when you're go if you're going out on a date or you're giving a presentation, you know, I actually put on a, like a regular shirt today rather than a sweatshirt uh, for this uh, because I care more about your judgment than my typical day of sitting in front of this computer. So the reality is all these mechanisms are quite important. So what does our brain look like? Well, I like this cartoon here. I had to modify it a bit, but if you could see the flashing light here. Our brain is basically a, a collection of these evolved mechanisms. We call them evolved psychological mechanisms, and we have them for different things. Uh, here's a parenting instinct, if you can see my pointer here. Um, we cheat others, right? Humans cheat to some degree, we know that. Uh, that, uh, that we recognize objects, children recognize if you place them over a high spot, their heart rate goes up even with babies, infants, even before we teach them that it's dangerous to be in a high place. Um, language is an instinct. There's a critical period by the time that we can learn language. And if we miss that critical period, it's hard for humans to learn language and so on. There's many more than this. And the fact of the matter is the brain doesn't look like this. It looks more like this. This is actually a, a fMRI picture of the brain. And let me just point out that you see the fear here? right in this cartoon one well this is fear in your brain if you put people to an into an fmri scanner and if they're afraid of snakes you show them a snake this part of the brain lights up these mechanisms although this is cartoon they actually lie in your brain somewhere the same way that if i showed you your favorite food a different part of the brain would light up and if i uh if i had uh, someone treat you badly a different part of the brain would light up so it's not quite so simple as this, but we're starting to really, thanks to the technology, see where these things lie in the brain. It's a relatively simple process that I'm talking about here, information processing model. These mechanisms, I'll show you another example after this that might make it even easier. But these mechanisms, they get triggered by stimuli in our environment and they produce the right response. So if you will, there's input, the input gets processed by our brain, and then the brain produces a certain output. So if you will, if I brought a rattlesnake in the room you're sitting in right now, and, um, and um, what, what would happen is you probably would have your predator evolved psychological mechanism activated, and you would probably tear yourself away from this presentation 
stand on something, run out of the room, right? Stimulus, process, response. It's really not so different when you press your calendar app on your phone, it opens your calendar, right? The stimulus is pressing the app, it gets processed by your operating system on your phone, and it opens the right response. When, if you, when, you, pro, when you push your telephone app, the, the phone uh, comes available. It's exactly that model, it's based on an information processing model. Now, here's just to make it a little bit more specific, right? So if you will, there's thousands and thousands of these mechanisms. I just have three here. Hostile, uh, uh, conspecific means uh, individuals of the same species, contamination, EPM, and pot potential made EPM. So let's just isolate three of these for a second, okay? So if you see an, someone walking at you with an angry face, which one do you think it elicits? Hostile, conspecific EPM, and it produces it activates the fight or fight response in that situation. You may feel scared. You may have an increase in aggression if you can't escape from it. Now, let's change that angry face to someone just vomited on the seat that you're moving towards. Well, that triggers your contamination EPM. And your fight or fight response doesn't get activated. Your disgust response gets activated. You avoid it. And if you got it on you, you're going to run to the restroom and wash it off of you. And then last one, let's change that in heterosexuals to an att uh, attractive face of a member of the opposite sex. Well, that triggers the potential mate EPM. And uh, once again, that creates a very different response. So we're constantly processing information. If I drew the face, it would go, oh, sorry, go over here. And uh, we'll go over here, here's the nose, gets, gets input, brain processes it, and produces a certain output that solves the problem. And so uh, just to show you this, open forum evolutionary psychologists are defining human nature and they're using a model like the, the uh, chemistry uh, uh, table of elements. And they're looking at, at for each of the major evolutionary process, what is human nature and not just what it is, what is it, what's the function and where does it lie in the brain? And we don't have time to get into that now. I gave you a little piece of that. Certainly fear of predators is a natural selection, a survival selection mechanism. It's protected humans. What happens to humans that did not fear snakes in the evolutionary environment? They were eliminated from the gene pool. Snakes were a threat in our evolutionary environment. That's why it exists in our brain today, even though it's largely irrelevant today. People that, humans who felt that snakes were cute and went to pet them, eliminated from the gene pool. Humans who ran from them, protected themselves, were the ones that lived another day. And as a result, those are the genes that are represented in our gene pool. So there is a mechanism somewhere in our brain. Actually, there's been people that have been able to peer at this in, with some of the new technology, a mechanism that creates a fear response in brains. And by the way, for the record, in case you think that that's learned by our culture, like you watch uh, movies that show snakes, um, chimpanzees and primates in general are terrified by snakes. If you go to the zoo and throw a stuffed snake into a chimpanzee's cage, it would become terrified. So, and they're not watching the same media that we are. Let's do a quick poll here. Did evolution design us well to function in our modern environment? All right, so I'll share the results here. And in general, if I ask this question to a, just a typical audience not attending a talk like this, overwhelmingly people believe that evolution designed us through the process of natural selection to, to be in our modern environment. So for the most part, with a, if you will, a naive audience that you would get about, um, uh, about 90% um, or even higher saying that evolution did design us to function in our modern environment. However, I think partly from the title of this talk and partly from your interest, you may know a bit about this already and it's something I'm particularly interested in and, and we'll cover this as, as we move towards the end here. Point number three is the fact is that evolution did not necessarily de um, design us well 
for our natural environment. And, um, uh, and so I'm gonna show you some, just some examples of that. But in general, I'll, show, I'll just show you two examples that are really causing big problems right now. But, uh, but the fact is in many ways that this is true. All right, so, okay, let's look. So this is something that we call a uh, mismatch theory, evolutionary mismatch or mismatch theory. And this is probably some of the most applied research that we could do. And it's something that uh, my, some of my students are interested in, some of my doctoral students are interested in looking at right now, and I'm particularly interested about writing about it. And so keep in mind, this is an essential point. Natural selection, right, the evolutionary process, adapts organisms, us, to their past environments, the environments for, for which the trait was a benefit. So for hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of years, humans had to deal with snakes. And as a result, our brain has a snake detector. The fact of the matter is, it's largely irrelevant. Most of us never come across a dangerous snake. Snakes only kill about 10 people in the US for the, in each year. But yet this, uh, this mechanism, this evolved psychological mechanism exists in our brain nevertheless, right? Second point is, when the environment changes, uh, as ours had, right, think about it, we lived as, we evolved as hunter-gatherers in a much different environment. And when an environment changes, there can be misfiring, or what we call mismatches, and once again, I'm gonna bring this to light for two examples in a second, leading to negative consequences. If you just look at this image here, right, why do so many people have back problems? Well, we weren't designed to sit so much, and sitting creates back problems. Humans, like others, there's no other species that sits on a chair in front of a computer. And that creates huge problems for humans. Humans weren't designed to do that either. Really, it's happened in the last 30 or 40 years that, that humans are sitting so much. Most jobs, even before the technological revolution, were things that you stood doing. And uh, even this lecture, I would be standing rather than sitting in front of a computer giving it. So that's just one example. Example I wasn't going to cover. It's more of a physical thing, but it's an interesting example as well. As we get into this, one way I want you to think about this, I've been making this case that our modern environment is equivalent to living in a zoo. That think of zoo animals and that's humans. Humans are living like, like zoo animals in the current environment. And the punchline for this is this, we live longer and we're safer, but we're less happy. And that, and, and, <clears throat> and I'm gonna show you why that's <clears throat> the case in a second. So when we look at zoo animals, what we find is they live longer than, animals in the environment because there's no predators in the zoo and because they're fed regularly so there's they have plenty of resources that's true of humans as well humans survive at a rate that defies any other species no other species has most of their species living outside of the first five years uh the or the equivalent of the first five years for humans let alone to 50 or 60 or 70 and i mean what's again equating for the lifespan of that species humans are an exception in that way. And once again, we're largely protected and we have plenty of resources for the most part, pre-pandemic. Even with the pandemic, we're doing actually much better than any other species. Let's look at this example. Uh, and by the way, I'll definitely make it before 12 o'clock, so we'll run right on target here. Um, our taste preference. Is our taste preference an adaptation? Now, if you were public, usually I would get your response here, but here's what I want you to think about. Our taste preference, is not an adaptation is i'm sorry is the product of an adaptation because and these didn't exist in the evolutionary environment but humans who pr food was scarce let's start with the environment right we have to consider the environment that something evolved in food was scarce humans who preferred high fat high sugar high salt foods were able to tolerate a famine or a lack of occasional resources much better than those who didn't and by the way, you can throw overeating here as well. So humans who ate more than when, than when they were hung, ate more than they were hungry for and preferred high fat foods were more likely to survive in the ancestral or the evolutionary environment. Humans who preferred low cal foods, they were eliminated from the gene pool during the first uh, uh, famine or lack of ability to access resources because they had no extra weight on them and they were eating the wrong foods. So 
So if you will, our preference here is a very strong adaptation, evolved psychological adaptation, but for very different environment. Now, I would argue now, this preference is killing us. It's actually the major thing that's killing us. So one is we have foods created for us with no preference at all for nutritional value. And the fact is these foods play havoc with our physical symptoms, uh, systems, uh, right? They're killing us, literally, right? That's not a, an overstatement. And these foods inflame our body. They make us more prone to almost every illness is the product of inflammation in the body, arthritis, cancer, uh, um, uh, mental illness. And these foods are inflame our body. They didn't exist in a natural environment. We wouldn't give them to animals. We wouldn't give a Dorito chip to our dog, and we shouldn't. And we shouldn't be giving it to ourselves. Obviously, Doritos is not sponsoring this talk, but, but that's just many of the foods we eat are processed and, and unnatural. And so they create problems, right? The other thing I want you to think about is think about the way we access food now, right? So by the way, not only do we eat more and we eat foods that there's no equivalent in a natural environment, calorie content, right? There's no food that in a little amount of space, like a chip, has so many calories. That's a problem. Two. Think about how we secure food. We used to have to hunt for it. We, didn't, we weren't always successful, right? Well, this would burn off huge calories just securing food. And also, it was unpredictable. Food shopping, drive through you know, food delivery. I can, pre-pandemic anyway, I can be sitting in my house, not move from this seat other than to answer the door, and have food delivered. How many calories does that burn compared to doing this? huge difference. How, how re uh, regular is this? How predictable is this versus this? Huge difference. I know I'm going to eat, even in the pandemic. So something that's an adaptation that, that was evolved for is now, because our environment went from scarcity to abundance in, and, and, and unnatural abundance, that it's caused us to, right, we can't not bump into food in the pre-pandemic era. So what's the health consequence? Look at the obesity rate in the US. And by the way, obesity, as you know, obesity is, the, is other than age, obesity is the greatest predictor for dying from coronavirus. And the reason is not just that it's obesity, but that obesity is associated with all types of comorbid conditions, like diabetes, as an example. And, and six types of cancers have been linked to obesity as well. So here's where we are about now, right? Somewhere around here, right? to 2020, the prediction is by, the, by 2030, at the current rate, obesity will affect half the US population. Now, the reason is, once again, we were not built for an environment that has an abundance of food, has unnatural foods that are high calorie, and also that's so easy to access. And if you had to start running around after your food for starting tomorrow, this obesity rate would decline substantially. So I'm not going to get into it now, but we need to seriously think about our understanding of human nature. How are we going to move forward? How are we going to predict the health cons consequences that were already staggering? Just diabetes alone costs billions of dollars a year to treat. Okay, I'm rushing a little bit, just the last slide, and then I can stick around for 10 or 15 minutes for questions. If you can, let's think about this. What's another modern threat, so to speak? Uh, well, social media. We know that social media causes depression in almost anyone that uses it to some degree, and severe depression in a proportion of the population. Uh, if, if my uh, GIF is working here, uh, right, the light switch being on and off, when you use Facebook, you are, what is Facebook? Facebook is humans advertising, signaling, posting their good stuff. We weren't meant to be seeing everyone's good stuff, you know, 24 seven, depending upon how much you use this. As a result, our social comparison mechanism, and in particular envy, that's the mediating emotion through which Facebook and social media causes depression. That's the thing that's associated with depression is what, we, what I mean by mediation there, that, that it's constantly being triggered. You're seeing people eating at places that you want to eat at. You're seeing people on the vacation that you want to be at. Now we all know it's, Oh, selective, people are not saying, oh, look, I just got a D on this test, let me post it. They're only posting the AIDS, 
right? People are not saying, my kid didn't get into college, let me post that. They're posting that their kid got into an Ivy League school or a good school. Despite knowing it's fake, the research shows, we still feel envy. Our envy mechanisms, for the lack of a better way of explaining this, get worn down. And over time, we feel depressed. We feel less good than others. So, right, obviously, avoid high fattening foods, avoid social media. It's not so easy because we want to connect. We're a social species. So I know I covered a lot of material here. Oh, and by the way, just if you want to see over time, look at the increase in, look at the increase here in a social media use over time. If I showed you a graph on depression, it would be similar, not quite the uh, rise. Depression is increasing over time. More and more people are getting depressed and the increases are the greatest as the technological revolution has occurred. Obviously, Facebook is not sponsoring this talk. Uh, thank you for your attention. I know I covered a lot. I wanted to get some of the basic points across and I'd be glad to um, answer any questions that you might have. I guess you could either chat them or speak. So I'm not sure of the format here, but um, let me see here. I can't read this. Uh, not sure. So uh, questions, uh, you can chat them or ask them. You have to unmute if you're gonna ask them. I'm wondering how you might factor in RNA. Well, I mean, I don't. Uh, I'll just extend that for a moment with the with the the phone apps. I, I would suggest that the the hard drive of the phone is the DNA, and the apps are RNA. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I to be honest, I don't really study the biology of this other than the neurobiology, but. Um, I mean, there's certainly, it's a, it's a good model uh, if you wanted to bring it down to that level. I, I think it's a, a model that, that certainly fits because, the, I mean, I think the point you're making is that technically the apps are kind of software and the hard drive is the hardware. And I am sort of linking those together. But yeah, so that's, that could be a, a good distinction for those that would know to make that distinction. But thank you. I believe that Drew has a question. Sure. Um, okay. Okay. Um, Drew? Has the relationship between height and partner been replicated in same-sex relationships? So, um, I mean, you couldn't really, rep so uh, you couldn't replicate that finding in same-sex relationships because if males always wanted a shorter male, if you will, you run into like a catch-22 there, right? Meaning uh, if they would both have the same preference. Same-sex partners, interestingly, tend to have um, same-sex partners tend to have the same preferences of the of, of the sex. So, meaning males, same-sex uh, male couples have male-like mating preferences, and female couples tend to have more female-like mating preferences. So, this is a complicated area to get into, but uh, but so the preferences are sex specific. So males keep their preference and females keep their preference. Other questions? I know this is a clunky system for questions, but. I have a question, but oh, Sorry. TV. I'm listening. Can I go ahead? Yep. Um, 40 years ago at work, I had a friend who was an Egyptian Arab, and we had a very strong disagreement about whether it was okay to kill a, um, a family member who had been sexually disgraced. Um, I thought it was wrong, and he said, no, it's, it's what you should do. So the question is, uh, yeah. isn't that all environmental? Well, remember, my, so my, my, point, my point about, so certainly cultures have different attitudes, right? And the question, though, is that, that at a core, 
at a core, do most cultures feel that way? And cultures have, you know, pretty strict um, rules around uh, and, and attitudes around something like sexual promiscuity, as an example. So, um, but but once again, in that case, that is an exaggerated form of that attitude. And, and you'll see that, by the way, we'll see lots of bad behavior throughout the world, but it really is still just a product and extension. I'm not justifying it, just to be clear here. In fact, lots of human nature is pretty dark, but, uh, but so it's just an extension of, at some level, the fact that, especially for females, that almost every culture uh, uh, frowns upon sexual promiscuity. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's been clearly replicated. So once again, that's what my point is, that's sort of like the dessert model that I use, which is, it's, it's not so unusual that what underlies it, the behavior definitely is in the more unusual realm. Yes. Other questions? Hi, um, I realized that one of the other participants had asked a fairly similar question before, and I do recognize that it's a it's certainly a complex matter. Um, I'm a couple and family therapist that works primarily with same-sex couples, and I'm curious if you have any recommendations for, you know, literature or resources on kind of that evolutionary uh, perspective on homosexuality and that kind of thing. Yeah. So this is one of the more controversial areas, but let me just answer your question about counseling. Just in the last two weeks or so, maybe a little bit longer, so you can just Google it. The New York Times had a survey of couples that you'd probably be interested in that showed that same-sex couples were happier than uh, heterosexual couples. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the reason makes sense, right, if you will, like the conflict that, that occur in heterosexual couples is because males and females are actually different in lots of ways. And, and we all know that, and that's part of human nature. Once again, we can deny human nature, but we, we all know that. And same-sex couples tend to not have those differences. Um, I, what there is in, in clinical psychology, I know there are books on, once again, not something that, I'm, that I sort of follow, but there are books on dealing with, with, with gay couples. And um, now with regard to evolution of homosexuality, it really is a very complicated, like it would take me a half hour to make the lecture without offending anybody. So and I, <laughs> that's why I'm just gonna stay clear of, uh, it's sort of a third rail. So Understood. they've already offended like females or males based on things I've said, uh, but, uh, but it's, it's complicated, but there is an evolutionary explanation. And once again, you could just Google it and just keep in mind that, that homosexuality exists in almost all species. You could start mm -hmm. with. Thank you. You're welcome. I see a question, a chat question. Is killing this within the same species human's particular character? So that's and it's, it's an interesting point. And uh, so yes and no. So meaning most other species only kill for food or if they're threatened. Well, humans kind of do that. Most wars are based on the perception of threat. Most homicides are based on the perception of threat as well. Once again, the anomalies are things like serial killers. But but those that does that only counts for a very tiny. Uh, number of um, of the homicides uh, in the world. So now, what's interesting though is that there is evidence that chimpanzees, our closest genetic relative, are the only other species that goes to another uh, group's territory and kills them and and occupies their resources. So, if you will, chimpanzees wage war the way that humans wage war where we go somewhere else, we usually kill a sub selection of the people and take their stuff. And right, and that, um, and that is a, a common what happens where that might initiate war, someone taking your stuff, trying to take your stuff. Uh, so chimpanzees do, and they're 99 point something percent similar to humans. Uh, that's the only other species that exists. Uh, Carol Goodall is, there, has, had observed it and videotaped it if you wanna Google it on the internet. Any other questions before we stop? All right, everyone, thank you for your attention. And I think attention anyway, I can't see anybody, but uh, I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, by the way, if you want, uh, I, I'll try this. Uh, if you want a book that's really gonna 
help you see this. It's, a, it's an oldie, but a goodie. I still use it for my, the class I teach in evolutionary psychology at Hofstra, but Google the blank slate by uh, Steven Pinker, P-I-N-K-E-R. Uh, you could probably get it for, you know, a dollar paperback copy on, on Amazon, used copy. And it's a great book and it sort of really flesh out some of the areas I'm talking about. It's a bit dated in terms of the research, but you probably don't really need that in terms of these points. I think he's the master at making them. Okay, have a good day, everyone.